Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Transition Accelerator's 2024 Pathways to Net Zero webinar series. Um, I'm Julia McNally, Director of Climate Action at Toronto Hydro. And I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples on which we work and live. The Transition Accelerator with staff from Victoria, BC to St. John's, Newfoundland, recognizes and respects the ongoing relationship that Indigenous peoples have to this land and commits the ongoing process of reconciliation. We're excited to have such a diverse audience join us today to listen to Mo Cabrera, Transition Accelerator Vice President, in conversation with Saul Griffiths, co-founder and chief scientist at Rewiring America, and author of Electrify, an optimist playbook for our clean energy future. As a climate leader at Toronto Hydro, the city of Toronto's electricity distributor, I am particularly interested in this conversation. The city of Toronto has set ambitious climate targets and we at Toronto Hydro are committed to helping make them a reality. We do this through our core business, modernizing and expanding the grid to meet the energy transition. And we've recently established a new climate team with a mandate to help our customers electrify their buildings and their transportation. So I'm both honored to be here, but I'll be paying really close attention to the discussion and taking lots of notes. Uh, so thank you. Welcome to the conversation. Uh, and Mo, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Julia. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in uh, to this really exciting uh, conversation. I've been really looking forward to this uh, conversation with Saul um, and uh, really looking forward to uh, you know diving in some of the questions that we've received over the last a uh, few few weeks since we've uh, kind of put it out there that we're uh, trying to uh, you know get try to understand what people want to hear uh, in terms of um, uh, you know some of the questions that are top of mind uh, related to electrification and uh, uh, you know I want to say uh, also before I get started uh, that um, we're excited to be hosting Canada's Net Zero Forum. Uh, that's happening uh, between uh, May 14th and 15th in Toronto. Uh, so if you want more information on that, feel free to uh, to join in. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to have uh, Saul, who from um, you know Rewiring America, and uh, more recently uh, Rewiring Australia. Uh, so co-founder and chief scientist. Um, so Saul, thanks again, really, for your time and also for doing this so early. Uh, I actually wanted just to flag that one of the first times I've come across uh, your your work is I was in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and I was at this very small bookstore there, and I found your book. Uh, so I think you'd, you'd like to you'd be delighted to hear that your book has made its way to uh, this. I think Lunenburg is a UNESCO town because it's one of the towns that still have the the, the structure uh, or. It's, it's sort of the urban planning that hasn't changed. I think one of the, uh, like from, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago, but uh, welcome. Uh, how are you doing today? And thanks again for waking up so early. Uh, it's not too early. I'm, I'm an early riser. I am, it's 8 a.m. Australia time. Um, I'm good. I hope everyone doesn't mind me a little bit loopy. I actually had shoulder surgery last week. So I'm, I'm dialing in with a few opioids in my system. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I won't be too uh, crazy today, but uh, it's great. No, that's, that's great. Really appreciate it. Um, so maybe just to get started, you know, you, you are a long time, long time advocate uh, for electrifying everything. Also uh, the topic of, you know, your latest book that you just, uh, I really like the title, you know, an optimist playbook for our clean energy future. Before we dive into the details, I want to ask, uh, you know, out of curiosity, how did you become, you know, the, the electrification evangelist? And uh, how did you, you know, why should we be uh, electrifying everything? Let's start at the very high level. Um, so really, I'd spent 20 years in Silicon Valley building clean energy technology companies um, and clean energy technologies. We did a lot of work with the Department of Energy in the U.S., and one of the projects I did with the Department of Energy was mapping the entire energy system of the US. So every energy flow, whether it's the energy used in um, slaughterhouses or the energy used on school buses or the energy used to pump natural gas through 1 million miles of pipelines, 
it was this incredible diagram that mapped the whole energy system from coal mine all the way through to toaster for all the different fuel types. And then that was sort of a map, if you like, for the energy transition. How do you continue to do all the things that we do on the map, that map? So the, you know, drive our kids to school, cook dinner, um, heat, our, heat our homes and run our businesses. How do you do all of those things, but in a way that can be zero emission? And if you look at each one of those individual flows, the answer for zero emissions on nearly every one of them is electrification. So I think I had a, a wonkier title for the book originally, but Paul Hawken said one word titles the best. So I have Paul Hawken to thank. He said you should call it electrify. So maybe I'm now the guru really because Paul Hawken has a better sense of book naming than I do. Um, but underlying it all, is sort of very, very deep analysis of what is actually physically possible, what doesn't, you know, what obeys the laws of physics as we know it, and how, how do you get there? So electrifying everything is yeah. 85%. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, what I like to say is like, when we say electrify everything, it's sort of a nice, uh, you know, easy term for people to understand, but also we understand, at least from my perspective, you know, we're, we're basically saying electrify almost everything. Would you agree? We are, but I think it's, we're, we're living in a dangerous period of net zero and um, mm. all of the governments of the world yeah. absorb this net zero idea. Uh, <clears throat> what is pernicious about that is in, in the early 2000s, we believed that we might do bio, bio energy with carbon capture and storage. It was going to be this magical negative carbon energy technology it hasn't really worked out but because of that a whole bunch of fossil fuel producing countries like australia like canada lobbied hard the ipcc to allow negative emissions in the transition scenarios to zero emissions we got addicted to that and i think greta thunberg says it with more honesty than everyone else we used accounting tricks to try and square the books and so the ipcc modeled in more negative emissions of carbon later this century than current total tonnage of fossil fuels we put out of pull out of the ground like it's literally a physically unimaginable amount that we've modeled in so most of the scientists that i know don't believe we'll get anywhere near that level of negative emissions which really makes net zero look like actually you just have to do actual zero uh, and it means you've got to do it a hell of a lot faster and so I was very consciously electrify everything. I, I, I will only mm. under stress concede to you almost everything because I can imagine a few things that we might do without electricity, but it simplifies the understanding. It calls out this carbon dioxide removal lie that's baked into the IPCC. Um, just to give you why does this happen at so at the latest cop 28 that's the ipcc meeting that just happened in dubai finally for the first time in 28 years all of the world's countries agreed that we have to go to zero emissions on fossil fuels yeah but they they very heavily lent on zero emissions and they didn't give us a date of when we need to get off it and if you mm. look at the, the literature and you look at the numbers the difference between hitting 1.75 degrees with no negative emissions and 1.75 degrees with negative emissions is um, $30 trillion worth of wellhead gas and coal and oil or $300 trillion worth of fossil fuels sold to end consumers. So we've been hoodwinked by the fossil fuel industry to really, really rely on these negative emissions. And it's the negative emissions which allows you to think that there might be pathways that aren't electrify everything because they want to be able to burn some fossil fuels over here so they can do negative emissions over there and it's just got it it's just not going to happen and we have to call mm -hmm, out the government mm -hmm. call this out yeah and then you have to understand that underneath it it's just a huge pile of money that these fossil fuel companies are defending so electrify yeah. everything if we want to get into details yeah. of almost we, we will need to make fertilizer <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah that will need hydrogen, but actually, oh, wait a second, how are we going to produce that hydrogen with electricity? Oh, steel making. Well, we need to get to zero emission steel making. Well, either you use hydrogen or you just use electrochemistry. 
both things again start with electricity so actually even when you go into the details it's pretty hard to see what we won't do with electrification yeah no and i totally agree and we can i mean we've been uh, saying you know generally electricity is the backbone of this transition and you know and that people you know, uh, overall are starting to understand more and more and the growth that we are expecting to the electricity system to accommodate the, you know, the, the promise of net, uh, of net zero with electricity, you know, is, is requiring a lot of investments, which kind of brings me to the next question I had. Um, you, you've called electrification anti-inflationary. Uh, and I'm kind of curious about, you know, how is how, how did your team... Um, and you uh, personally uh, work, uh, you know, use this economic approach to help, you know, with the passage of the uh, U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which has become synonymous really with, uh, you know, economic competitiveness uh, in this uh, new era of, of energy transition globally, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to find if I have the anti-inflation chart here, I could even flash it up for people. Um, so the interesting thing, mm. The interesting thing with uh, fossil fuels is that you buy a cheap machine up front, but then you pay a long time into the future for expensive fuels, and those expensive fuels um, are volatile. So you have events like COVID or the Ukraine happen, and yeah. the price gets very volatile. So the interesting thing about electrification is you buy a slightly more expensive machine up front. So the electric car is a bit more expensive to begin with, but then you're feeding it very cheap and very consistently priced electricity into the future. Because when you finance a wind farm or a solar farm, you're financing it for 20 years. So really you're producing at that cost for 20 years. So if you take an Australian household or a New Zealand household, they've already gone through this anti-inflationary moment where electrifying you know, we know that in Australia, the, the price for all of the energy costs for an Australian household. So we're very similar to Canadians. You're colder, but we use more air conditioning. But this story will also eventually be true in Canada. So in 1980, we spent $2,000 mm -hmm. a household buying gasoline, buying natural gas, buying electricity. Um, that has risen to about $7,000 per year per household in 2023. Um, if you electrified the 1.8 vehicles in that household, if you put rooftop solar and a battery on the side of the house of that household, not to provide all the electricity, but you know, about a half of it, which is easy here. If you electrify the heating and the cooking and all the systems, the ongoing energy cost will be about $2,000 a year for that household. So that $2,000 a year is sort of fixed 20 years in the future because you've bought all these machines, you're just paying off the finance on them and the finance costs are fixed. Whereas if you continue to be a fossil fuel household, your rise prices would rise and rise and rise and rise and rise over the subsequent 20 years. So it's literally electrification is anti-inflationary. I don't think the world's economists have grown mm -hmm. with what this really means. I think I suspect it's really important. I don't, as a physicist, I don't even dare to sort of guess why, but um, you know, the majority of our energy system will go to this anti-inflationary state we've now modeled in australia that the average australian household would save two thousand us dollars per year right now so that means we pass the economic transition point um, where everyone should electrify everything so under the status quo by 2040 australians will spend 2.2 trillion dollars buying cars buying water heaters buying space heaters buying kitchen hobs, all the fossil fuel burning things in their lives. If we spent $2.1 trillion, about $100 billion more to buy the slightly better electric machine for all those things, we would actually save $1 trillion over the over those 18 years on our energy bills. So $100 billion investment now saves the nation $1 trillion. That will also be anti-inflationary macroeconomically. It's what energy economists have been looking for for years the it's the they have a term which is called the energy productivity which is the gdp divided by the amount of energy used turns out electrification of all these machines is so efficient we'll use half the energy but the gdp can be the same 
So in sort of these multiple really big ways, electrification can truly be anti-inflationary. And in some countries like Australia, New Zealand, we've already crossed the threshold where the investment, you, you literally can't spend money fast enough because it just saves the country macroeconomically. It's not as true in the United States as yet because your gasoline is cheaper um, and the natural gas is cheaper. I think in Canada, yeah. I don't know the retail prices of, of it well enough to guess. Um, it, it, yeah, yeah. But it's getting, yeah. It's getting we're doing we're doing a very similar analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I I think it's exciting. I think the only way to beat the the lethargy of the status quo is to sort of out neoliberal economics them. So mm -hmm. here is an yeah, I, I at nation state level that the, the best thing that nation can do is invest in electrification of households and businesses both for climate, but actually for energy productivity, for national economic outlook. Yeah, no, that's, that, I love that. It's, it's the way that you framed it uh, makes a lot of sense. And we've been actually looking at this analysis for Canada in terms of uh, how uh, electrification can help, you know, uh, reduce overall energy costs. As you kind of highlighted, it really depends on what your baseline fuel cost right now is. And in some regions of the country, uh, you know, gas is very low. Others, it's more expensive. And there are, we have few regions that are highly dependent on fueling oil. So like uh, eating oil, right? So like in in those jurisdictions, it's really a no brainer, right? Like to go from fuel, heating oil to uh, electricity, like there's a lot of money to save. So this is, this is, okay, this is great. Of, of that anti-inflationariness. So the black line is the increasing cost mm -hmm. of, of energy, the total basket um, for the cars and for the house. And then, you know, that's starting in 2022, that's the cost of the finance for the whole electrical kit. So you're paying, you know, at 5% interest for all the things. And really you're just waiting for the moment where that gray box is less than the what they call the green premium so you know you're going to save forty two thousand dollars over 10 years is it forty two thousand dollars of incremental spend to get the electric car and the induction stove and the electric water heater and like you said if you're competing against fuel oil it's almost a slam dunk right away the secret the other secret yeah. source in australia is we have prolifically cheap rooftop solar. It, we, yes, we do have good sunshine, but it's not markedly different from the United States. It's only about the same as Mexico. But we don't have the regulatory burden on rooftop solar that they have in the US. So rooftop solar in Australia mm. installed 55 US cents per watt installed, which means financed. It delivers electricity to your house at three or four cents per kilowatt hour which is almost 10 times cheaper than buying it from the grid here, which is about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you have that really cheap upstart yeah. rooftops and you have relatively expensive fuel oil or gasoline or petrol, then your country might be yeah. just over the tipping point. And then, um, then I think we can see policy that looks like the IRA, except um, even more comprehensive. Right. So the IRA was just tax deductions. And in fact, it's a little bit regressive in the sense that not everyone will make enough money to qualify for the tax deductions to buy the yeah. qualify. So we actually just um, drafted proposed policy for Australia, where the Australian government becomes the financial backstop for every household, regardless of income and credit rating to do all of this electrification. And we use this macroeconomic argument for the country and for the treasury that this just makes economic sense. And it's being taken very seriously, you know, whether we will have that policy victory this year or next, I don't know, but it, it will, have, it's inevitable. I'm hoping we can do it sooner. And I think that's a really interesting way to look at the, um, look at the transition. Yeah, I'd love to help you that's, that's great. And I'd love to help you guys on that analysis in Canada. We've, we're doing it also in New Zealand. In New Zealand, has gone through this transition. They, their secret advantage is they have 
very cheap and prolific hydroelectricity. So every every country sort of has a different advantage. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And and uh, the the unique or like not necessarily completely unique, but the situation in Canada is that we have provinces like where I live in Quebec, where electricity is nine cents a kilowatt hour, and we have a lot of hydro, and we also have provinces that have you know, a, a lot of fossil fuel based, uh, thermal based electricity, right? So Canada is very mixed uh, and electricity could be up to 25 cents when there's that volatility in the natural gas uh, uh, prices that we saw last year, for example. Uh, on that, I, you know, similarly to the work that you guys are doing and talking about synergy, we actually uh, saw the pace of progress report that Rewiring America put out and we're inspired by that. And we've done our own analysis, which I want to kind of share with you quickly here and, and get your thoughts on it. So I'm just going to share my screen uh, super quickly and um, uh, talk about this analysis. I'm not sure if you guys can see my screen. So, so basically, uh, the question is really like, to what extent do we need to accelerate residential building decarbonization through electrification? to meet our 2050 goals. And here, you know, we see the, uh, you know, the standard uh, technology diffusion curves that uh, that we saw, we've saw we seen historically. I was actually looking at these for a different reason today because people say like, oh yeah, like, you know, EV sales are slowing down. So therefore, uh, you know, the tr this is not really happening. But when you look historically, like you can see very clearly here that, you know, there's dips, right? Like it's not a it's not a linear trend that keeps going up. Sometimes there's there's bumps, like you know, clothes washers there in the 40s. You know, there's a world war and people weren't washing uh, buying clothes washers the same way that they were. Same thing with the auto automobile during the Great Recession and the and the 40s. And there's a lot a lot of different reasons why things kind of you know slow down for a couple of years and then pick back up. So we kind of use the same methodology that you guys at Rewiring America did in terms of understanding the annual sales, uh, the stock turnover, and really the target that we need to hit uh, from to, to basically achieve uh, full decarbonization of the building sector. So well, we looked at heat pumps and we looked at heat pump water heaters. And you see here, uh, we've modeled out using those S-curves the proportion of uh, space heating uh, sales that would be needed to to be all electric to be able to convert uh, the whole building sector to 100% adoption. So we really need to be uh, by 2035. We need to be only selling new equipment that is uh, electrified uh, to be able to uh, achieve to achieve that stock turnover that leads to um, a decarbonized building building sector. And we kind of also mimicked your approach of like concretely where are we at over the next few years like so where is our current trajectory where do we need to be and where is that uh where is the gap so our you know our analysis shows that we're uh kind of we we, we need to be installing uh hundreds of thousands of additional heat pumps than the current trajectory to be to get on track and every year you miss it you miss that it's going to be you know it's going to put you even behind on the s curve which means you're going to have to do uh more there maybe maybe any thoughts on this in terms of like the challenge of that for people to understand the whole concept of technology diffusion and why it's 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 very much uh, it's not necessarily like a straight line right and there's a lot of things to that needs to align including making sure that there is uh, that you have a consistent pace. So I've just brought up a competing slide. This is like. Um... Uh, it's like a rap slam, right? Where like, I'm going to outslide you. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Here's here. We, yeah, we're, so we're, we're doing this work. So these are, these are, can be called adoption curves if they're tracking the rate at which these things are selling, or I think it's useful to think of it as penetration curve. So this is the yeah penetration curve you need, which means how many, what percentage of households have the water heater, the space heater, the kitchen electrified, the wiring upgrades, the electric car for the first car, the second car, the battery on the house, rooftop solar, that won't be for every house. But yeah, the, it's now, honestly, for a one and a half degree target, you need to have 100% adoption pretty much by the end of this decade for a two degree target, like you said, maybe 2035, 2040. Um, and that's humbling. 
because um, it is really fast. But you know, your first slide showed that we have adopted things like flushing toilets and the television and cell phones this quickly before. Um, and it's not perfectly smooth at the beginning, even though we draw these pictures um, perfectly smoothly. Um, the, the good news though, is it it is really happening in most countries. So I think if you, if you wanna hear all of the bad stories about climate, there are plenty, but if you wanna look for the good news story, no matter where you are modeling this now, um, the adoptions are increasing, the penetrations are increasing, the rate of increase is increasing, so we're accelerating. Um, there's a lot of news stories about how America is sort of declining a little bit in electric vehicles right now, but that is completely untrue. If you look globally, Europe and China are going, they're still climbing up the curve in terms yeah. of electric vehicle sales. Electric vehicle sales picking up in Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia. So you know, globally, these trends are going in the right direction. There will be local bumps. And remember, there is an industry defending <clears throat> $300 trillion in future profits that's trying to slow this down. <clears throat> $300 trillion is a lot of motivations to, you know, play naughty in the, um, in the media sphere, misinformation, um, try to slow this down with reg regulations. So, you know, whether we can do these things this fast also depends upon the regulatory environment, depends on the permitting environment, it depends on the workforce. We are woefully short of the technicians and the electricians and the tradespeople required to do all of this work. Um, so, you know, I think it's good to track this thing. And I think by tracking it and showing the, the positive economic upside, we can also have very concise policy prescriptions for governments like this is how many people we need to have in community college level training programs to learn to do uh, switchboard upgrades. Um, this is how many people we need to have in yeah. certification courses so that they can safely install level two vehicle charging in every house. Um, and we can start to set the targets and track uh, track our pro process. I, I think it's important. I'm not quite as zealous as some of the Silicon Valley people on tracking and metrics, but I do believe it's good to have some. And and this is a concise way of, of yeah. analyzing what our task is. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, across the board, that's kind of what we've been trying to push for here as well, which is, you know, like a talent and skill strategy for different sectors, including, you know, like we're talking about, you know, what do we want to do uh, and how do we make sure that we have the pipeline to deliver on that, right? So we know that we need X number of people to be working. Like you say, you were saying, like there's all these uh, types of jobs, but there's also the jobs that we're attracting. Like battery, the, we got a lot of battery manufacturing investments announced over in Canada over the last few years. A lot of big gigafactories, cathode cathode facilities. Uh, you know what is what are what are the jobs that will be required for those as well? One of the questions from the audience that came in, which is really like, what skills and areas of expertise do you think people will be most demand, and how can like educational institutions kind of adapt? And I feel like you've kind of half answered that as well. But linked to that, another question that came in was really about like, there are some undergraduate students, young people that are motivated to want to play a role in this transition. I feel like. When I talk to people uh, in this, like, you know, that are looking, thinking about skills and talent, seems to be like a lot of despair and like uh, negativity, I guess, from the younger people who don't necessarily like see a, a bright future, right, ahead. Um, I guess, like, what would you say to somebody who really wants to? You know, play a key role in help making this happen. What, where, where they should they, where should they be focusing their? Efforts? I understand the temptation for younger people to be a little bit negative. They're being handed a pretty tough basket. But the good news is, I think more concisely than ever before, we can prescriptively say this is what we need to do. Um, and I think it is interesting to contemplate <clears throat> the engineering we need. We absolutely need more chemical engineers. We absolutely need, you know, weirdly, hardware is back. You know, everyone wants to go and um, write AI and make their Silicon Valley fortune. But what we really need is old school skills like chemical engineering and metallurgy and electrical engineering and power 
electronics. Um, and there's a huge amount of job security for anyone who wants to go into any of those fields, even, you know, go in, you know, aerospace is interesting again, because we're going to electrify an awful lot of aircraft. There's a, there's a whole on the professional engineering track, it's pretty easy to state all the things we need. We know we're going to need metals. We know we're going to need batteries. We know we're going to need vehicles. We're going to, we're going to need to electrify shipping. We're going to need to electrify a lot of flight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So tons and tons of jobs. I think the more interesting question, because that's a little, um, you know, that's a nice story for the high end of town, but really the heavy lift of this transition is at the technician level. And I think yeah. if you think about the jobs that all countries have ignored over the last four decades to their peril are good tradespeople jobs. Um, in, a, in the US, they're called contractors. I think in, the US, in Canada, you also call them contractors. In Australia, they call them tradies. I think right now, one of the huge problems is that the person that's installing your heating system is selling against the program here. So in most countries, if you call someone to replace the water heater and you have a gas water heater, they say, oh, I can have a gas one in tomorrow, mate. And they sell against the electrical upgrade. So I think we have to turn those people into the sale force. And I think that happens by really recognizing that the actual army that's going to get this done, the people who are going to save our ass here are the tradies and the contractors. It's not the boffins doing metallurgy and making a slightly better cathode. The enormous workforce that we need, where the far great majority of jobs is going to be created, is going to be in all of these um, skilled trade installations of all of this kit. So actually in Australia, we're working this year on a, um, we're still fighting the culture war over climate for the last two decades, where a lot of these contractors and tradespeople swung to the right because they want to have their big truck that belches diesel and they want to have all of these. Mm. They're skeptical of the electrification. They're skeptical that it's going to create the jobs. We're trying to flip that narrative in Australia this year, where in fact, Rewiring Australia is sponsoring the best tradie at the um, at a surfing competition. Um, Sixty percent of Australian tradies or contractors surf once a week, um, but you know we're trying to highlight that tradies are, and contractors are the critical element in this transition, and they are the heroes. And I think by doing that and changing that narrative and giving them this central role in this societal transition, rather than oh you're just the the person who shows up to install the thing, let's give Elon Musk all of the credit, um, I think is really powerful. So I, I think rewiring everywhere involves really increasing the cultural value of the actual workforce that's going to get this job done and getting them on team to mm -hmm. sell the, the transitions. They are literally the touch point for most households for all of these things and for most small businesses. So. Um, I see there's a huge opportunity here. So yes, and you're, you're young, about to graduate from nice university, please go into engineering. If you don't go engineering, at least go into policy making so you make better policy. Um, but even more important, you know, raise your daughters to be electricians and HVAC installers. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a great point, Saul. And like last year, we we did this. Uh, so we have an initiative here called Electrifying Canada, which we which we oversee, right? So uh, uh, insp inspired uh, by by Rewiring America, I would say as well. And uh, we had um, sort of a convening uh, tour across Canada uh, to really try to understand where every province is at when it comes to growing their system and electrifying their their economy and one of the things that kept coming up and we had you know a representative from the international brotherhood of electric workers as well right so that in every in every uh every table that we hosted we had local representatives from the ibw there and we heard you know like the question that i would kind of pose to them is like let's say you know politics is solved we don't have any political problems we got all the money in the world we get technology solved. Can we can we do this tomorrow, right? And the answer was always like, no, we don't have the people. Like we need the people. So I really think I really think the the point that you made related to con the contractors, the skilled the, the skilled trade, uh, the trades tradesmen uh, valuing transition jobs 
is is so uh, like critical and you know we're all we're really kind of chasing these like big value added manufacturing jobs but also kind of losing sight of like there's a lot of economic opportunity and economic benefits that are coming along for the ride you know just more actually local communities and then and there's value in that as well right in terms of having more uh you know local locally uh focused jobs as opposed to kind of you know, there's a big plant that everybody goes to and works there. And that's where, I mean, not to say that, that that's not a good thing, but it's also important for us to not ignore the the jobs that are coming from the, all the installations of these systems, which is a point that you make in, in the book qu- quite well by also quantifying those benefits, right? Like how many jobs and, and those jobs are going to be so distributed. Uh, so, yeah. I've done, um, I've actually written two books since Electrify. I wish I had copies here. Uh, I don't. One is called The Big Switch. So Electrify was really climate energy policy. It was sort of written as a love letter to whoever was going to be the incoming president. So really, I wrote I wrote this for Uncle Joe. Um, the Big Switch is really much of the same content, but um, for the general public. So much more practical. What do you do? What are the impacts on your household and your community? And then the third book I wrote is, is called um, The Wires That Bind. It's sort of more like just a hundred page essay. And it really steps through what this transition looks like for communities. And I'm gonna bring up a few slides. I'm not sure they're exactly the slides. So I, I warn you, they, I, <laughs> I may have to jump around a bit, but this emphasizes that yes, there are gonna be jobs in green steel. That's great. There's going to be jobs in offshore wind. That's great. There's going to be jobs manufacturing batteries and wind turbines and solar. All of those things are good and we should celebrate those. And and it, it is a lot of jobs, but it's not as many jobs as actually the installation, maintenance and upgrade of our local distribution grids. And I think the way that we can get to this and tell the story is to look at how it changes local economics. So here is sort of a cartoon if you like of the energy transition for a community so i live in a suburb called austin mere it's got about a thousand households in it it's probably like any suburb in ontario or any suburb in in america um it's actually by the strange standards we're extremely average we've got the average age, the average number of children, the average number of people per house is very similar to everywhere else in Australia, slightly higher income, um, but own the same number of um, cars, have the same level of mortgage. We're one of six suburbs in a zip code called 2515. And that yellow is the zip code. Again, this is extremely average. And I'm going to talk about this because actually the electricity grid throughout the world is um, basically designed on delivering electricity to about one suburb underneath one zone substation. So there's the big generators out there in the wilderness. They send electricity over giant power lines. And when it gets close to you, that goes through a local substation and is distributed on the local poles and wires. So literally everyone in our community are connected to these wires that bind. That's the origin of that title of the story because we're all connected Every one of our houses is connected to everyone else at this local community level. So there's the local substation. That's literally the map of all the um, local high voltage distribution lines. There's low voltage that goes to every house off of those purple traces. Um, We're very normal. We're on five strings. So literally that substation goes down five strings and connects all of the houses underneath. Now, the interesting thing is, I'll, I'll skip a few of the slides about solar, but we could produce about 60 or 70 percent of our electricity underneath that zone substation on our roofs. But interestingly, we need to have almost three times as much electricity to, you know, in 2040 as we do today on those local poles and wires. And you need that three times more electricity because you've electrified the water heaters and the cars and all the things. So all of that increase can come from the rooftop solar, but the rest will have to come from the grid, offshore wind, hydro, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, 
this is 2022. So this is pre Putin. So you'll notice here that my numbers are lower than I began. So it's $5,000 a year. It, it's now $7,000 a year, but the thinking about the proportions. So if you're a fossil fuel house, or as as our community runs it today, the average house spends $3,400 a year at the local, there's one gas station in our community, it creates basically one job, it sells you three things that can kill you tobacco, fossil fuels and sugar. Um, and you every household sends more than $3,000 a year on a one way ticket out of our community creating only one job in our community, right? That's what all that giant black arrow is just the community bleeding money. We also bleed money buying natural gas down at the bottom, but it's only about three or $400 a household per year. And we bleed about a thousand dollars a year that leaves the community buying electricity from the grid. So the community is sort of gets about $23 in community spending from this $4,800 spend on energy. If we, fast forward to the future that where we're going, right? In 2030, we won't be buying that oil, well, 20, 2030, 2040, insert your target, not buying that natural gas, not buying coal generated electricity, but instead buying wind and solar, we'll still be buying $1,000 worth of electricity from outside the community. But actually we'll be financing the solar cells locally, the batteries, the heat pumps, the cooktops, the water heaters, the electric cars. And if you look at it, actually, it generates about $5,600 a year in community spending, because instead of spending money on that petrol, you're spending money on local mm. rates, people and contractors installing the solar and the battery and the vehicle charges. And you're saving that money and keeping it in the community. If you think about it as a community, and hopefully these slides aren't too confusing they, they're, they're part of a larger narrative but sort of the net community looks like this and just think about your suburb there's there's three elementary schools in this suburb there's one high school in the neighboring zip code um you know it's it's very much like anyone who's dialing in and who lives in some vaguely urban area this is probably typical so our community collectively spends $15 million a year buying that oil and that gas. We spend about $4 million a year purchasing electricity from the grid. In 2030, we'll still be spending the same amount of money buying the electricity from the grid, but we'll be creating $1.4 million a year in local electrification labor. That should lead to about 25 direct and indirect jobs. And we'll be saving about $21 million a year in the community spend principally because we'll be using locally generated solar instead of um, gasoline and think about a community that's saving 20 million dollars a year and that money we already know that 50 to 60 percent of every household's expenditure is in their local community you're buying groceries locally you're going out to dinner locally you're going to the movies locally so actually about $12 million of that $20 million will be respent in our local community. So as exciting as the, the electrification labor jobs are, the even bigger job creator, interestingly, is because mm. of the lowering of the cost of our energy, because of this anti-inflationary effect, it will create 400 jobs in the local community at cafes, at movie theaters, at you know new jobs for school teachers. Or you can think about it as like, this is the biggest opportunity for local economic renewal in a century. What we've done steadily over the last 50 years is take all the jobs out of the community and lower their quality. So a Walmart comes in and you, you kill retail and you create pretty awful stack, shelf stacking jobs. And all of the money in your community goes on a one-way ticket to Bentonville, right? This can reverse that trend in keeping money circulating locally and be a really interesting, um, yeah, really interesting economic model. So, that I'm I'm really optimistic and bullish on this. And then, really, you're just modeling at which point in the transition will which countries and which communities benefit. And like you said, Ontario, if you really have nine cent, I think you've got a mix of nuclear and hydro with nine cent a kilowatt of nuclear and hydro. You guys would be in the money immediately. So, yeah, so Quebec, Quebec is Quebec is nine, Ontario is about 14, 15, but it's still pretty good. 
Uh, but this is super fascinating, Saul, and I really love the way that you presented it, especially, like I said, the local impact beyond, uh, I mean, like you said, beyond just the actual direct electrification jobs. I want to get to some of the questions from the audience uh, here because, you know, there's a lot of interesting questions. One of them is, you know, the revenue from the cost is lost fuels, right? So the question we've got is, is you know, what strategies have worked for rewiring America or rewiring Australia for overcoming incumbent gas utility influence on climate and electrification policies? Um, nobody has won this fight anywhere yet. So I think we are all exploring different strategies. Um, I am suing the gas distributor in my state as an individual. I've now... Um, I just bought a new house, sold my old house, but on two different properties, I've electrified the entire household and I've turned off the gas. It turns out I have to pay the gas company a few hundred dollars um, to have a technician come and turn the gas cock off, literally just tighten the thing. And I have to pay them about $1,500 to remove the gas from my property, which is what I would like. And I actually was wondering, oh, they must have a contract to have their pipes on my land. There must be some deed to the property that, you know, they have a right to use my property, but that's not true. So they, I, I should be allowed to have them remove the, the gas lines from my property and not charge me $1,500 to do the right thing, which is to go off gas. So think about the absurdity of this. Every household in Australia is obliged to spend this 1500 bucks. It's like, we're gonna voluntarily spend, give the gas companies $10 billion to turn off gas. So that's why I'm suing them. It's anti-competitive behavior. They were granted the right as a monopoly from the Australian energy regulator to charge a household for switching off their gas. This is absurd. This mm. is anti competitive. So I'm also taking this case to the anti competitive and anti corruption um, case here in Australia. I know people are working these types of angles in Massachusetts and other places, but like we've got to figure out these fights. I think the other, the biggest fight really is not just, you know, there's the regulatory fight there's the there's the cultural fight it's still proving that your walk will be better when it's induction that you're you know there's a lot of communities and cultures that were indoctrinated with that blue flame we've had 40 years of natural gas telling us about this clean blue perfect magical flame we still got to overcome the brainwashing of that 40 years of advertising um i don't know that anyone has the right strategy here yet so i think there's regulatory assault which i'm working on i think there's prosecuting the economic argument um it's going to save you money etc 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 but that only works if you think humans are truly homo economicus which we obviously aren't right <laughs> some people yeah. buy some people buy a mercedes when they could drive a honda civic so i think the idea that we're all spending money rationally is dubious but nevertheless we should keep saying you will save money when you do this your community yeah. will benefit yeah. But um, I, I, I wish I could give you the answer that I have, a you know, we've got this solved. But I can say that because we've shown that the economics works, because we pointed out where the weaknesses in the regulatory environment are, we now have the state of Victoria in Australia actually planning the complete gas transition, turning it all off very, you know, in the next decade, because they've... Oh. There's, they've there's enough arguments now that can support the brave politician who wants to take on the fight. Mm -hmm. So I feel like yeah. maybe, maybe the project is for all of the rewiring Americas and rewiring Australia's and, and organizations like yours is collectively just to make enough arguments that we and arm the, the politicians with those arguments um, so that they can commit to winding down the gas infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think another very interesting argument is if you don't do the gas network transition very quickly, the last people on that network are going to be highly penalized. It goes non the cost of the gas network goes non-linear as people fall off it because you've got to maintain the same number of pipes but have fewer customers. And so actually there's very good economic arguments to 
plan this and do it very quickly as opposed to do it very slowly. Otherwise, you're going to harm the lowest income and the most vulnerable households. So I think you got to you know, yeah. build on and all it's interesting too. Yeah, we saw we saw this decision recently from the Ontario Energy Board here in Canada, where uh, basically they were right now. If you if you're a developer and you hook up a new home to uh, the natural gas connection, you you get uh, basically the cost is subsidized, or it's there's like about five thousand dollars where it's rate based and it's allowed to be amortized over like a thirty year period. And they basically said there's a risk that you're not going to be able to sell gas for thirty years because of you know. The climate uh, change conversation and the fact that you know the world is changing and the, and we think this is a too, too much of a risk for ratepayers, so we're not going to allow that cost to be uh, you know rate based. Or, so therefore, you know the developer should cover it. Um, I mean, I'll mention that the, the government is actually over planning right now to overturn that decision, like to, to actually intervene and and overturn the regulator. Um, but at least it's a it's a positive sign that at least there's an acknowledgement of the the of the risk of a stranded asset, right? Uh, and 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 the actual cost. So was it? They make a climate argument. They make an argument on the demand that they have to protect ratepayers, right? From an from a financial perspective. I want to get even more radical and I see a lot of really good questions in the chat and I'm sorry that we won't get to all of them, but yeah. um, I think people should understand that electricity grids in the, throughout the world used to be municipal. They used to be owned by the city and administered on rates, same as your water. In most of the world in the 1980s and the 1990s, we decided to privatize our gas and electricity networks. We didn't privatize water. You have to ask yourself, well, why is that true? But in privatizing it, we then went to this guaranteed rate. I just want someone to tell me if they can still hear me. I can hear you. Oh, great. I just saw a blank face. I was like, oh, oh maybe it's frozen. Anyway, the um, we're giving guaranteed rates of return of 10 to 20 percent to these infrastructure companies whether they're gas or electricity and they've all been corporatized and financialized in fact in australia the gas network is now owned 60 percent by china and 40 percent by singapore stock markets and our electricity network is not much better so this is curious right so 50 years ago as a taxpayer and ratepayer, I owned the local poles and wires and local gas distribution network, but somehow it got taken away from me and I'm giving a guaranteed profit to these entities, yet I won't guarantee the right of the same as you know, an Australian householder like me installing solar and selling it to my neighbor. I won't guarantee the, the investment that they make in a battery, even though that battery will make the local distribution network work that household isn't getting the guaranteed 10% rate of return that we're giving to the electricity distributor. So we're in this absurd situation where we've given the keys of the kingdom away very unwisely, just at the moment where this highly distributed transition is really our best and only pathway to decarbonization, which means a lot more, you know, the largest battery in Canada will be your, your 20 million electric vehicles. Your, the largest generator will be, you know, Solar, I know it's Canada, but solar is now cheap enough that even in Canada, you will get a lot of useful energy from rooftop and community solar. Um, that will be the cheapest energy because it doesn't have to go over the long distance transmission networks, but it's in conflict with these regulated monopolies that we have for the gas and the electricity networks. I think there is a huge amount of work. Nobody anywhere in the world, and in fact, in places like California, we're going backwards in terms of redefining this social contract between the household, the utility, the state, local governments, who owns these assets, what are the rules of energy flow on these assets. These are absolutely the most, you know, this might be intolerably boring, wonky energy nerd stuff, but like, I think we win or lose this transition on on literally on this question of how we redefine what infrastructure is and we redefine who owns the assets and who gets to um, who gets to benefit.
you know, governments call that gas network infrastructure, but they're not calling your electric car or your rooftop solar infrastructure. That's crazy. Your, your electric car and the, the battery in it is just as much infrastructure as these gas networks. Like, I think we've got to change a lot of minds about the structure of our energy systems. Otherwise, we're going to give the, give the profits away to regulated monopolies again. And actually, uh, um, one of the questions that is that is up, up next here is actually related to this, which is, you know, what do you think is the relative importance? You know, what we call it optimal mix, optimal mix of like storage, demand response, expanded grid connection for enabling renewables and grid grid decarbonization, and how can we build this out to really like make sure that there's resiliency? Like, if we're trying to optimize between clean, resilient, and affordable. Those are the three things that is, you know, top of mind for people here in Canada as we talk about electricity policy. Um, so yeah, maybe just comment a bit on the role of storage demand response versus, uh, you know, more of the expanded grid connections. Um, like I said earlier, we need to deliver about three times as much electricity as we do. In Australia, two thirds of that can come off the local generation assets in Canada will probably be about half that about one third because you're further from the equator yeah so that's means a significant amount in Australia the you know wind or solar in, installs at three or four cents a kilowatt hour which sounds the same as the three or four cent kilowatt hour electricity on your rooftop but it's not it takes three cents to get that over long distance transmission lines it yeah. takes another two cents for the billing cycle and other couple of cents for some environmental policies and it costs 12 cents for the local distribution grid so that's why the same cost of solar cell delivers from your rooftop to your house at three or four cents but from the transmission grid at 30 cents so you can already see it's it is inevitable that people will wake up and realize that the cheapest energy system in the future will maximize local generation generation and storage assets to do as much of the management and as much of the generation and as much of the storage as possible locally under that substation that's why i talked about the substation and then you buy the winter filling gaps and the dark day filling gaps from the larger grid um, there'll have to be a partnership with industry because industry will have to also pay a part in this sort of demand response but um the cheapest energy system will be maximizing local assets, both in generation, but also in the management. So using the batteries. And like I said, you know, compared to, um, think of it this way. If you had one Rivian in your driveway with a hundred kilowatt hour battery and one Tesla with a 60 kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour battery, that's 160 kilowatt hours of storage parked in your driveway. Yeah. Um, that's four days, including driving. Um, if you're not driving and you're snowed in and you want to last it out a week, that's a week's worth of power. So the ultimate resilience strategy also maximizes the local distribution of these assets and the local sharing. So we are not, our regulators have their eye on last century's prize and they're not designing a lowest cost system for us. They're not even incentivized to. There's actually a distinct conflict of interest between most of the energy and electricity market regulators now and this future. And we got to call it out and like that, that is the, you know, the, the, the next fight, you've got to win the policy fight to create the money to create the demand and the things like the IRA happening, but at the same time, and now we have to accelerate this winning these regulatory fights to make sure that the rules of this energy system incentivize faster deployment and as much local generation and asset as, as possible. Yeah. That's brilliant. So I have a couple questions here that I'm going to try to combine into one for, uh, you know, efficiency's you sake. We could also just go like super fast, two word answers to any questions. Yeah, yeah. let's do like, let's do a, a, like, a, I don't know, a lightning round. Lightning round, yeah. So I have a question about the, the effect of, of um, high rates right now uh, on allowing access to, you know, electric, electric, electrification products. And another one related to how we can prioritize or make sure that we are, um, you know, insulating low income and marginalized communities 
uh, from, you know, from sort of negative unintended consequences and making sure that those benefits are actually unlocked for them as well. And I feel they're kind of related, which is, like, I'll give an example very quickly. You know, like I said, it's a slam dunk if you have oil heating and you want to transition to electrify your system, like you can start reaping the benefits today. But the capital cost is a problem. There's a there's an affordability issue there. Uh, if you don't have access to capital, uh, you know, and those are going to be the lowest income people that are not going to be able to unlock the benefits of electrification. So maybe quickly, if you can comment on that, the impact of the high rates and uh, whether that actually negatively impacts uh, or disproportionately impacts low income people. Um, the most expensive Range Rover you can buy in Australia costs you $263,000. If you buy that Range Rover, you've chosen to burn those fossil fuels and spend $263,000. If instead you had bought a Tesla Model Y for about $80,000, you still got $183,000 left over. You could buy a $20,000 giant solar system for your giant rich person house. You could buy a $10,000 battery, a $5,000 top shelf, best in class induction stove, $2,000 heat pump water heater, and a $10,000 heating system to heat the whole house, right? And so now for about $120,000 or $130,000, your whole household is completely zero emission. And you've still got $120,000 left over to send the two kids to private school. So literally, there are, is a huge segment of the population now, which is just a planet fucking hypocrite because they choose the Range Rover over <laughs> the all electric car. This is, again, evidence that we aren't homo economicus. But what it really tells you, and I mean, these are, it's a lot of thoughts to squeeze in at the end here, but like the equity issue for me now is completely one of credit access and financial access, right? So that Range Rover driving house doesn't need to save two or $3,000 a year. They've got plenty of money so they can choose the Range Rover. But, you know, the single mum who's working as a nurse with a long commute, she's spending $3,000 a year on the petrol for her used car, which gets lower mileage than a new car. And the easiest everywhere in the world now driving an electric car off the grid is cheaper than buying petrol right unless you're in saudi arabia where they have ri ridiculous prices of gasoline yeah but that single mum doesn't have the credit rating probably doesn't own the house and so she's renting can't doesn't have control the decisions over whether she's allowed to have a vehicle charger in her garage and so is hugely handicapped in this transition and will be more handicapped as everyone else defects off the gas and her prices go up. So I personally think we will fail at this transition. There'll be a huge cultural backlash unless we figure out very big policy solutions to that type of problem right away. To give you an example, like I said, we are working in Australia on a piece of policy that's meant to be more equitable and more accessible than the US. We are proposing that the government allows every household to borrow enough money to electrify all of their things and put that borrowings at very low. The, the cheapest interest rate in the country is always what the central bank cannot provide. So the government has access. If, that, if it gives the lowest <clears throat> access and it lets everyone borrow money from that pool and pay it back, say when they at the sale of their property so the largest asset for every household is the home itself you do have to figure out the how do you get a renter and a, a landlord to do this but i think there are tax ways to incentivize the landlord to make sure that they electrify everything and pass the savings on but you know why doesn't the government step in with financing to make sure that where the bank wouldn't give that single mother nurse a loan the government will give her a loan to buy the electric car. They will compel her landlord to install the electric vehicle charger if that landlord would like their tax deductions, which we give out in great spades to property owners, but don't give to single mothers. So like really the equity question here is like structure of our tax system, structure of our incentives and making sure that everyone has access to the credit required for this transition, because I think it's the first point we made today, like this is about moving from 
um, cheap machines with expensive fuels in the future to expensive machines with cheap fuels in the future. And so that's the shift from fuels to finance. So you are not thinking about the climate solution unless you're thinking very, very big picture, like the IRA was not enough and was regressive compared to the type of policy we really need to get this transition to really go at the speed we do and do it in a way that's equitable. And it's kind of why I come to this sort of unsatisfying wonky position that equity in the climate transition is a finance and regulation challenge. It's big, it's big capital P nation building policy. Oh, I can't hear you. Mo can't hear you. But I can gesticulate in response. I'll do the lightning round while you find your audio button. Green infrastructure funds, yes. Um, watch this space. You'll hopefully hear some things in the next month. Uh, agri agrivoltaics is really interesting. I've got a mate here locally who's working on, he worked for the guy who designed 90% of the solar cells in the world, which came from Australian University, and he's making uh, agrivoltaics. They'll, they'll be huge. Um, I'm glad that you still aren't the Canada grid is publicly owned. That means you have more options. It means you can, you should go to the ratepayer meetings and kick up a storm and demand reform. Gas pipes could be used infrastructure for district heating systems. Not really. They're too small um, to run the steam or water required. Um, there are some interesting ideas that you, of repurposing at least their thoroughfares for doing ground source heat pumps. Um, I think all of those ideas are interesting, but they're probably going to be beaten by electrification on cost. Um, someone called me up for using the word natural gas. I absolutely meant to say toxic methane fossil gas. Uh, Can you hear me now, Salt? I can hear you now. There you go. Okay, perfect. Got some, got some lightning in. That's great. That was great. I, I actually have one more substantive question and a few kind of fun questions. We were right, kind of coming close to our, the end here. Really today. On this well, here, right? So heat pumps don't work, and uh, you know we need natural gas for the electricity system because it gets too cold. Uh, any, uh, I mean, we, we've we've talked a lot about this uh, and covered that topic, but uh, any anything you want to uh, talk about, sh shed some light on that uh, specifically from your perspective? You know, I have a graphic. Um, some countries are just going to have to do nuclear power. Canada might be one of them. Um, although I think if, you know, with sufficient transmission, some geothermal, uh, buying some, buying some energy from the U S in the summer where they're producing too much solar in the South, like there are options. I, I, I don't see a problem to make reliable year round electricity for Canada, you just got to think bigger than you are currently. I don't know, you know, heat pumps get better and better. They're called weather performance every day. Um, th that yeah. is going to be the same thing. Um, you know, small amounts of firewood, sustainable, you know, reusing municipal waste for heat. I think there are some other options that cover some, you know, cat, you know, every country is unique, every domain is unique. So you, you might need a little bit more of those things. Um, I didn't quite hear what the actual question was. It was a bit garbled, but, um, you know, I, I think you just have to keep looking for what the solutions are and, and keep re educating the public that we're, we're closer than you think, or we're already there. Um, you know, all of these technologies are getting to scale and, in, and increasing in their performance by a couple of percent a year. So that means in a decade, everything is twice as good as it was a decade before. That's going to be true. Of the heat pumps and the solar and the batteries, they're all on that yeah. learning curve right now. Oh, that's, that's a great point, uh, Saul. And lot, some fun questions to end it up, uh, end it on a light note. Uh, what is an Australian animal you'd least like to fight? Um, I actually met it 
on that bench top last week. Uh, the world's most poisonous spider is the Sydney oh. funnel web. It's, it's about this round and I'm not particularly scared of spiders. We have spiders here that are this round um, called the huntsman, although they're not poisonous, you know, this, this round versus just this round. But anyway, um, I got really excited because it was a new kind of spider and I thought it might've been um, actually a, a, a trapdoor which is poisonous, but not the worst in the world. So I captured this thing under a, under a glass container. And as soon as I put it under the glass container, it stood on its four back legs and it had these four front legs sticking up in the air. And it's like punching at me through the glass and you could see the fangs are dripping the world's most poisonous spider venom. And I just got this overwhelming feeling that this is the most terrifying creature. Like if it was a foot high, you would be terrified. If it was six foot high, you know, it's game over. This thing owns the world. It, it was just, it was so aggressive. It wanted the fight. It's like, I don't care if you're six foot two, I'm coming at you. Anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to fight the funnel webs. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm, here, I'm glad you're okay. And uh, I'm, I'm glad, yeah, you were able to show us even specifically where it was. And I think, yeah, we're at time. I want to, I want to really thank you, Saul, for your insights today. And really thank the audience for their questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one, but um, it's great. It's great to have you. I'd love to kind of do this again sometime as we kind of move through this journey together, right? As uh, we're trying to figure out all these different challenging questions, uh, as you as you mentioned, nobody has the answer. But uh, a big part of what we can do is keep trying and keep pushing. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm feeling more optimistic from this conversation. So really appreciate the injection of optimism. Thank you. And uh, yeah, reach out to me. Any final, any final words? Um, uh, electrify everything. Is that trademark? Um, <laughs> <on brand. laughs> uh, you know, hopefully we will, we now have rewiring Australia, rewiring New Zealand added to the rewiring family, starting with rewiring America. So, you know, let's talk about rewiring Canada. We're also, we're starting a conversation to rewire Britain. Um, like, I think we need to, create a global political force behind a lot of these ideas. Um, so there's there's a thought to leave you with. Um, I think we're successfully building a lot of little movements, but we need to really, you know, if we're gonna fight the world, an industry that that is defending $300 trillion in future profits, we need to work together. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for your time, Saul. And I'll reach out to you. Yeah, we could chat more about what we're doing and how we can uh, align some of the work. Tremendous. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining.